Hi, I'm Jan Doyle. Welcome to Classroom Connections. I'm really excited about tonight's guest. I met him um, because I read an article in the New Haven Register, which I'll get to that in a minute. But I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Fletcher to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It, this was a wonderful article. It talked about something called the African American Collection and Artifacts, and it was written up in the Register. How, tell me about that article a little bit. Um, basically, it was an article that was done um, based on the collection, the items that I have been collecting over the last 10 years, um, which consisted of slavery shackles, uh, Renaissance period um, literature, um, original photographs of uh, the uh, civil rights movement, as well as Jim Crow uh, signs and memorabilia. Well, when I saw that article and I saw your picture and I, there was going to be an exhibit, um, which is now passed, at the um, New Light High School, I took the opportunity to go down and see it. And I was just amazed at the things that you have collected. How did the collection come about? Where did you find all these things? Well, the inspiration came from my mom and my dad, who basically uh, were raised in uh, the South during the Jim Crow period. And uh, as my mom came north, north and they migrated from the south to the north, um, she just started collecting different things, which I used to tell her it was junk. Like what? Can you, can you remember anything um, specifically? Yeah, uh, figurines, African-American figurines, yes, yes, yes. which depicted uh, young children eating watermelon and um, uh, certain Jim Crow figures of uh, black children uh, reminiscent of buffoon type characters. Um, so as she was collecting all of these things, I, I would kind of look and look and say to her, why are you bringing other people's junk in here? Mm -hmm. And she would say to me very clearly, um, this junk I love, if you do not like it, you don't have to come. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so at that point, um, I just saw more and more of her, her collection starting to grow and she had a section in our home where she would just have those things on in curios and different things. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, she was not able to live long enough to see this, uh, uh, this collection enhanced and continued from where she started. And so the inspiration was behind this whole uh, collection was to, um, in, in her memory, to keep it going. When did you change from, that's very interesting because you're talking to someone who loves tag sales. Mm -hmm. I'm, and in fact, I put myself on, I can't go anymore because I, there's no room in my house for this stuff, mm -hmm. and, but I love looking at it. When did you change from feeling it's just junk to something that you also wanted to collect? Well, I started doing some research on some of the things that I was seeing, uh, and, and just to go back a little bit, um, not only were the tag sales that I started to see uh, along the sides of roads in different parts of New England, I started to go online and just start researching some of the things that I was seeing, and I started to actually start to purchase these things, and as I'm purchasing them, I'm looking online doing the research about them. Um, case in point would be some of the uh, cast iron banks and uh, originals and reproductions that I have in my collection. Um, come to find out, there was some significant um, um, connection to the Jim Crow period and how these items were stereotypical and mythical of uh, what, what, how African Americans were perceived by white people back in the uh, 1920s and even up as far as the, the 50s, 1950s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, we've had discussions prior to this and maybe even later, you know, it's, it hasn't really gone away. Um, now, can you tell me, um, when we were, when I was looking at your collection, there was uh, something that you mentioned that actually brought a woman to tears or she wouldn't hold something. Can you tell me about that? Yes, there was, um, there was in the planning process of having the exhibit to be at one of the local universities. And in doing the planning process, I felt it would be important that the people who were going to be hands-on with these items in my collection, they need to get a feel, a sense of what was going to be uh, in this collection and what was going to be in the exhi exhibition. So my, my thought process was, as I have everyone meeting in my basement where some of this collection is stored, 
I felt I wanted to see how sincere, how passionate they were going to be um, in understanding the message that I'm trying to get out. So what I did was I had, um, as you probably have seen in my collection when you came to the ex exhibition, in the case I have probably 15 to 20 pairs of different shackles from the 1800s during slavery, I had each of those professors and people that were going to be a part of the, uh, the exhibition, the display, um, to handle them. You know what, we have a picture of that, and I think this would be a good point for the director to put that up on the monitor when he gets a chance. And so where did these shackles come from? Like this is, I'm thinking about the first image that is going to come up, and it's on, it's on the monitor now. Where did, so what, can you explain these please? Yes, uh, the shackle that you, or the bracelet, as most people would look at, would be in your right hand corner uh, that has flattened edges. Inside those um, flattened edges are metal pellets. And those metal pellets were like alarm systems that were attached or placed inside those bracelets. So now you have where you have a slave child or an adult who comes to the plantation that is soldered, kind of soldered on by the black, blacksmith that um, is uh, assigned or works within that plantation to an ankle of a child or an adult. And the reason being is they, the slavers or the plantation owners wanted to hear where their slaves were or if, if, if they escaped, it would be easy to track them by hearing those rattles go off. And nine times out of 10, hmm. um, some of those shackles, especially as you will see the one I'm, I'm talking about, um, they were left on young children, left on adults. And so as you know, as you get older, yes. that shackle don't, doesn't move. The bone in the flesh ends up getting uh, in, embedded around the shackle, which causes infection. Now, mind you, everybody says that or thinks that the slavers were bad to their slaves by letting that happen. That was a very, very small population of plantation owners that ever let that happen. The majority of the plantation owners they, they, they revered, they, they held their slaves in, uh, in high esteem only because that was how they were going to make their money, is having healthy slaves and people to work the fields. That makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, the, the director put up the second slide. Is this a continuation of what you were just talking about? Yes, uh, these, this is a continuation, as you can see, um, the slave tags. Uh, it's, it's reminiscent of the movie, uh, 20 Years to Slave. Um, where uh, now those are slave tags. Those are slave tags. And where would they wear those? They would wear those either around a rope or a some sort of uh, leather that would go through the hole. And the only way that um, they were allowed to leave the plantation or the property is to have one of those tags affixed around their neck, because if they were caught without those tags around their neck to show where they came from. Um, they would be uh, considered runaways or put back into the, the slavery system to be auctioned off. That's amazing that you got those. How did you find those? Um, again, internet um, and then auctions. I have a friend who's in the South and he goes to these auctions. And a lot of these auctions are, they're, even though it's not said, they're pretty much segregated. And when you go in there, a person like me, an African-American, is going to have a difficult time trying to buy these artifacts mm -hmm. or to bid on them. And it's already preconceived that the owners or the, the persons that are going to bid on, they are white. And they're going to win the bid. And so my friend being white, what he will do is go into the auction and bid just as everybody else did and have an a, uh, even chance at winning the bid. But if I were to go in there, the bids would, some of the bids were rigged. And so in saying this, the reason why I'm saying these closed bids are segregated still is because there are people who do not want this history to be told. They do not want this history to be seen. Um, and this is why this exhibit is called um, America's Distorted Image, because it has too many fingerprints on what had happened during the slavery the last 150 years. Um, well, this, I think the interesting part to me is as a retired teacher, and we taught this, and I mean, I know I didn't do it 
give it the um, justice that it deserves. But I never saw slave tax before. I never even heard of slave tax. So that we're uh, ignorant of a lot. We're not passing history down correctly to the children, and we're not giving them the information that they really should know, or teachers should know. And, and you know, some that's that's it's correct in what you're saying is about the information being passed on. I mean, I'm learning, um, mm -hmm. and everyone might think uh, that I'm sitting here, the the uh, expert in African American history. And I have to tell you, since this has this ex exhibition has this uh, debuted, um, I've had a lot of white people give me interesting facts in history about some of the items that are in my collection. And so I'm learning. Oh, really? Um, I'm learning. And if there's any person out here that says I, they are the, the authority or they are the intellect on African American history. I, I, I would tend to disagree with them because um, no sooner than the information was given to me from someone who was white about some history that I, I know in, that, in African American history, I'll go back and, and research it or I'll vet it and see. And sure enough, it's, it's actual information that's true. Are you writing this down somewhere? Because not you have a wonderful exhibit, but also you need to have a book to accompany the exhibit. And I hope you're writing this down as as you're getting this anecdotal knowledge and your research and you're adding to this. I am, I am writing it uh, all down. As I'm taking it because this is an, this is a journey. It is. It, it is. It's a journey. It was a journey um, as I started to uh, formulate my mind how I want to get this information to the mainstream. Um, so I am writing it. Um, I'm. I'm pieces of paper whenever I get a chance and even as I leave here I know I'll, I'll make some notes and jot some notes but it, it's a journey um, it's history that uh, you know I, I I'm learning mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, and I'm, I'm excited and I'm enthused about uh, every time I come in come in contact with a, a new piece well uh, I just wanted to what message do you want if someone looked at your exhibit or even just listened to you on this program, what message do you want out there about your, the artifacts that you have? You know, I, one thing I want to tell people is this, is that, um, you know, this information is not here to point the finger and say, um, Jan Doyle, it was your fault, or, or your director, or your producer, it was your fault because of what's going on and what had happened in the past. Um, this is not what this exhibit is about. This exhibit is, in, in this history, is about n never to let this happen again. Um, let's move forward because the conversation I'm having with people some, uh, outside of here is that, you know, can we forget about this? And my, my position is we can't forget about this because as soon as we forget about it, it will start to creep up and creep up as we're seeing now that's happening around the country within the last several years. Yes, we have. And, and uh, it's just reminiscent of where we were some 50, 60 years ago, and some of the things that are happening now is, uh, is starting to creep up. So what I'm trying, the message I want to get, get out here is that this is not about race baiting. This is not about pointing fingers. It's not about saying it's your fault. Um, matter of fact, it's about history. It's about history that I did not make, I did not manufacture. I'm just the messenger. And I want to make sure that everybody um, understands this. And I think that's, I think once we start to uh, be realistic and open about this history, that conversation that we've been hearing from all of the news junkets around the country whenever an incident happens in our urban communities or outside of our urban communities where it's affecting African Americans, um, once we start having that conversation and talking about this openly, then I think we're on the right track to bridging and, and, and cr uh, crossing that racial divide. I, I think the conversation and bringing things out into the open on any topic is crucial to explore a topic and, and get people talking about it so that you, I don't care what topic we're talking about, I agree with you 100%. I want to ask you, are there any other, it, I'm not aware of it and you might be, are there other collections of like this around the country or is this unique? It's unique for here, for what I'm trying to do here in, and I think in the Northeast. 
but it's it's not unique for the uh, the bigger hubs like Washington D.C., Atlanta, Chicago, um, where you have installations. Um, and I want people to understand this is not an installation uh, where it is somewhere where you can open the key, turn the key, open the door, and walk in and see. Which I eventually, some way down the road, I want to have it installed. But there are other places around the country where people are collecting and they have it but they're not sh uh, showcasing it so um, in a sense it's unique for here and I think that is the reason why there's a slow burn on the attraction to it because this is a gut check um, and when you come to this exhibit it's a it's a total gut check and that's what I get from people is that it's up close and personal and um, again, you know, where will you see this aside from a, an installation, Smithsonian, Schomburg, Civil Rights Museum, and other venues like this, uh, like the Smithsonian around the country? Well, you know, that's a very good point that you make. And I was able to go to the high school in New Haven, just get in the car, go down, and it was a wonderful exhibit. And I saw things I had never seen before. And and I don't think, and it was in a school, and I, and I would like to see, I'm hoping for you, and I'm hoping for areas around that places like this take advantage of your exhibit because not only in high schools, but in colleges and other areas. I'm even thinking um, the Mark Twain House, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe House, because it's more accessible to the average person, and it's not a major trip going to Washington D.C. So I think I think that you're on the right track. I I was very impressed by everything that I saw, but I was also informed that in a way that I hadn't been in the past. I'd like to go to the third picture that we have, and when um, it can go up on the screen, and we can talk about what it is that we're seeing, because I, I think I have a total of four or five pictures. Now, this is an image that I found very, very interesting. Would you explain it to me? Yes, uh, this was in one of our southern cities in, in the south during the uh, civil rights movement, where, um, and if you notice, there, there, it's not only African Americans in this march. Uh, there's a white gentleman that's marching along with them in support and solidarity. Um, and. Back in the 60s, the uh, African-American man, whether it was in the South uh, or in the North, um, they were feeling as though they were second-class citizens mm -hmm. and treated like second-class citizens or below a second-class citizen. So that's when they, they started to get together, African-Americans, the SNCC and uh, Southern Christian leadership. Uh, they got together and they... they they started to have these marches around around the South and around uh, the country. Well, it's unbelievable to me that I'm not sure if the audience can see it, but it says, "I am a man." Mm -hmm. You know what? Which... Well, because the, the African American men men were considered boys, and that's why back then you would see some movies where you'd see an African American in the movie, and especially if it was. Something in, is reminiscent of the To Kill a Mockingbird um, with uh, Gregory Peck that was in it, and there was African American uh, actors that were in it, and the males were referred to as boys. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a boy is what? A, a, a young person, a young child, a male child. You know what who, I used to teach? They were all kids. Right. Yeah. And so that's what the whole I Am a Man movement was about was that. We're no longer boys, and you can never can't call us boys anymore. Um, we're grown men, and mm -hmm. we need we should have that respect uh, mm -hmm. given. Well, that was a very powerful picture, uh, and one that I wanted to make sure was shown on the set. Now, there's is, uh, there's one more picture. There's actually two more, but explain this. This is uh, you had a display case of all ta of all. Um, words and explain this one for me. Okay, this is one of the probably 10 um, metal, cast iron metal signs that were, that were basically in every public, not this one, this one was uh, in, in our United States military um, installations where white officers uh, had their own um, separate bathing and uh, shower facilities and blacks had theirs or colored troops had theirs. <laughs> But this is one of many signs that you would see 
in the South, uh, planted in public uh, places, restaurants, movie theaters, um, uh, transportation hubs. You would see these signs where, especially movie theaters, where they have, uh, where it said, uh, colored in the balcony. Um, and these signs meant what they meant. You did mm -hmm. not deviate, nor did you change, nor did you go uh, to the white, white officer's side or go to the balcony where you're not supposed to be. If it said white officers to the left and colored officers to the right, you better go there. And, if, and, and there were laws that stated that uh, if you violated those, uh, those ordinances, uh, you would be uh, placed in jail. I suppose what struck me and why I chose that to take a picture of it, what struck me was that it was the military. Mm -hmm. and, I so, and I think, a naive again, I think I thought it wouldn't be in the military because you're all brothers. You all are fighting. You're all brothers. You all lay your life on. And, and maybe that was true on the field, but then when it came to going to the bathroom, that wasn't true? Is that? Well, and, and again, if you go back, and one of the pieces that a part of the exhibit is I have a, Tus uh, a, a dedication to the Tuskegee Airmen. Actually, we have a slide on that. Okay. okay. So explain that. That this is a um, a figurine. No, he's not a figurine. He's a mannequin. A mannequin with uh, full um, uh, 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 items that were reminiscent of what a Tuskegee Airman would wear. First, explain what a Tuskegee Airman. A Tuskegee Airman. It was one of the. Um, major historically black uh, colleges that date back to the 1800s where African American went to uh, get educated because they could not get into the University of Alabama or University of Tennessee or so forth. So they were uh, accepted at, the, at Tuskegee where it was basically an engineering uh, school where a lot of these um, Tuskegee Airmen, which was Tuskegee University, where they uh, all graduated with uh, degrees in engineering, civil engineering, mechanical engineering. But when the war broke out, World War II, they felt as patriotic as, as white uh, people and wanted to enlist. Now, a lot of them enlisted into the, uh, into the United States Air Corps, which was now the United States Air Force back then. And they were officers, but they were not given the respect in terms of rank if they were second lieutenants, first lieutenants. Um, they were not respected by the white officers who did not have that rank. And a lot of them were assigned to doing kitchen patrol, latrine patrol, um, which is bathroom cleanup, and a lot of maintenance type of things on these bases in the European theater during World War II. So what you have here is this, is that these um, pilots made themselves, and there's a movie called Red Tails that came out several years ago, which kind of like glorifies and Hollywood um, portrays them as being the crack shot pilots as they were, um, going in and saving uh, a lot of uh, white bomber pilots who had missions over Germany and um, having a success rate of bringing those bombers back. And um, so what ended up, how they ended up flying to go backwards a little bit was, um, when Eleanor Roosevelt visited one of the European bases, uh, that uh, Air Force bases over there in, during World War II, she wanted to go up in one of the jet planes. And she asked if she could fly with one of the colored uh, airmen. And uh, I guess at that time, the FBI, who instead of the Secret Service was doing her protection, and the, uh, um, the uh, rank at the Air Force uh, uh, base, basically said, no, you can't fly with them because they're colored. And at that point, she just felt that that was totally wrong. And why are these men here? They are here because they want to serve their country. So what she did, and I'm doing it kind of like a roundabout um, example of this, but what she did, she got back to the States and she uh, confronted her husband and said, you know, that's a shame, these pilots are uh, over there and they want to fight for the country and they're trained and they should be allowed to go up in these airplanes and finally uh, Roosevelt uh, signed an order to uh, have them train as well as to fly missions. That's and so amazing what a, the the that's just so amazing the importance of a wife just in general and how they <laughs> make a man move a man forward but you told me something during the exhibit that I thought was fascinating, sad, but fascinating, 
they didn't get top quality uniforms. Right, and which is when it, when you saw that uh, uniform, as we see in the monitor, uh, there were hand-me-downs from the white pilots. And there's a picture that, when you come to the exhibit, you'll see a picture which is over or in back of the mannequin himself or, or the display. And you will see the pilots. And when you look at the pilots, you'll look at their equipment. Their equipment is not coordinated. It's mismatched. And it's, it's indicative of what I'm saying now is that a lot of their equipment, flight equipment, was handed down. They didn't get brand new equipment. So uh, what you see there are hand-me-downs that were given to these pilots to make best with whatever they had to do with them. Yes, that, that's actually amazing. I'm just going to do a time check with my director because I'm thinking we're, we're running out of time. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about, you had games in the, the exhibit? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there were games that were manufactured right here in the United States. And uh, it's funny that you, uh, you asked that because I was looking at them last night and I was doing some more research, uh, Sambo games, uh, Little Black Sambo games, and then they had a, uh, a Sambo target game where you shot magnets at it with a bullseye on it. And a lot of these games were manufactured here in the United States during the 1930s, and some of them went as far as uh, 1950s as well. And, and again, like I said, these, are, these items, these artifacts, memorabilia, is basically uh, why I call this exhibit America's Distorted Image, because a lot of these items that I've collected um, are images that distort in another lens, what America has seen uh, African American history through. And mm -hmm. there are, there's another uh, group of items that I have, which are um, uh, cast iron banks, which were made here in Cromwell, Connecticut. And uh, they, uh, they, oh, show, that's interesting. they show African Americans um, uh, with big lips, big eyes, big ears, um, caricatures. Caricatures that almost look ape-like figures. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Right up we're, the street. We're running um, out of time, and I want to make sure that if people are interested in contacting you for more information or for um, maybe finding out where your um, artifacts are going to be shown, because you, I know you're booking around the state. Is that correct? Yes, I am. And so what is your website? My website is www.AfricanAmericanCollections. And don't forget, put the S at the end of collections. You sound like com. a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a teacher. So, uh, so, And they can go to your website, and they can see where you're scheduled, or if they had further questions, or they want to contact you. You, that would be wonderful. And I also, if you, if people forget, they can also go to my website. It's uh, jmdteach at, oh, that's my email, jmdteach at comcast.net or www.classroomconnections365.com. You can always contact me and I can put you in touch with Jeffrey because um, I think this is too important mm -hmm. not to have you continue. What's your next step after here? We're um, where do you see, what do you see doing next in, in your artifacts? Are you, is there something you're looking for or you'll take whatever you can get? Well, right now what I'm trying to do is, you know, as we all, why I'm here is to do a fan base, but also somewhere down the road is to have a permanent um, fixture, a permanent building of some sort to house all of this collection because there's over 3,000 pieces that I have. Make sure you invite me to the opening. I will. Do. All right. Will Thank do. you so much for Thank being you. on the show. Thank totally you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to go over this with you.